This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. So on this episode, we are going to discuss nose hardware decentralization. We've already covered the first three major proposals to the Bitcoin protocol in regards to the Bitcoin block size debate, which was Bitcoin XT, Bitcoin Classic, and Bitcoin Unlimited. We also talked about other proposals that are out there, have some confusion to certain terms like what merging consensus was, what Bitcoin was, um, Lightning Network, uh, Sidechain, Mumblewimble, uh, those type of terms that have been bantered around in the discussion of the Bitcoin block size debate. On this episode, episode uh, 137, we're going to talk about nodes, hardware, and decentralization. Because one of the key pushbacks by Bitcoin Core is that all these proposals, whether it be XT, Classic, Unlimited, anything that doesn't really come from them, even one of the SegWit proposals that is out there, doesn't allow for decentralization of the network. So we're going to talk about the hardware um, nodes and what decentralization is. While there's some truth to it, not so much truth to it, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, but on this episode, 137, did you turn it on and off? Um, it's basically nodes, hardware, and decentralization. Uh, we're going to get into that. But before we do, let's talk about the news. So this is a bit old, but it's a major um, company within the Bitcoin space. Uh, New Egg has stopped accepting Bitcoin payments as of May 30th. Uh, there's been a few other uh, major companies that have dropped that. Eventually, we will discuss that, and it's just a result of the Bitcoin fees, the congestion, and the contention, and then the lack of improvements to enable and allow for companies to really accept Bitcoin without too much of a hassle, if you will, versus previous years when they did accept it. So that's just sad to hear. New Egg was one of the very first um, big companies to accept Former Mycelium employee quit after token sale funds were used for vacation by Kyle Trophy. On a recent episode of The Crypto Show, Daniel Quartz, who previously worked as a back-end developer at Mycelium, shared some of the issues he perceived with the big Bitcoin wallets provider's token offering from last year. Mycelium's initial coin offering, or ICO, was designed as a way to offer shares in the Bitcoin wallet to users. However, as the value of the tokens would have any direct connection to the value of the Mycelium wallet offering was not made clear in the basic terms and conditions of the crowd sale. As reported by Bits Online, such much of the funds raised during the ICO was spent on staff salaries and legal costs, and some investors in the Mycelium token sale have become disgruntled due to a previous lack of perceived lack of development activity since the ICO. And according to Quartz, who was perhaps best known for his contribution to the Nakamoto Institute, he was skeptical of the token sale from the very beginning and eventually left the company after he witnessed funds from the sale being used for a vacation in Spain. Rumors have been swirling from the possibility of a new ownership taking control of Mycelium, and Quartz added fire to those rumors during his recent interview. However, according to the Mycelium community manager, D- manager Dimitri Rosh uh, Marshik, many of the claims made by individuals on social media are untrue. Nothing was sold, Marsh told uh, Coin Journal. The company is still owned by the original owners who have no intention of selling other than the 5% stake already sold and maybe another 20% stake later. Uh, the, token sales, the token sale funds were used for vacation, and according to Quartz, the reason he, he left his role as the back-end developer at Mycelium was a combination of the token crowd sale with what the funds were used for immediately after the round of funding was closed. Uh, one of the first things they did when they sold these tokens is the is the kind of bought a vacation in Spain for all the developers. It was literally like a vacation because nobody did any work there. This is kind of why I decided to leave the company. I didn't like that they were selling tokens in the first place, and I didn't like that they were immediately spending the money on a vacation. When asked about the vacation in Spain, uh, Marshik admitted that it happened but had a different characterization of the event. Uh, we had a company retreat or a get-together to strategize. Yes, said Marshik. We all live around the world, and the boss wanted us to get to get us all together to strategize and how we should go forward. Believing that this is the best done in person was chosen because this is where the he was at the time, and it was the closest location uh, to all but one or two of our devs, since most live in Europe, and one was in vacation in Spain already. Only two employees had to be flown in from overseas. The entire trip didn't actually cost the company that much money, and we tried to save as much as we could. There was work done there, and some development, and a lot of discussion on business plans. 
issues to resolve or change in ways to improve security and privacy. Uh, when reached directly by Coin Journal, uh, Quartz has the following comments to share about the vacation in Spain. I don't know how expensive the vacation was relative to the to total token sale. I mean, it probably wasn't such a big fraction of the total, but it really made me feel bad that I was with a company that didn't have any revenue or any possible an, or any obvious business model. Taking a vacation is what you do when you sell out of a successful business, not when you successfully raise money that you are supposed to supposed to use to build a viable product. A ridiculous valuation of mycelium from the token sale. According to Quartz, you learned that mycelium implied a valuation of $80 million, which was calculated based on the funds raised from the token grand sale from an episode of Bitcoin Uncensored. Uh, Carson noted that it was a ridiculous valuation because, according to him, the company had $40,000 in total revenue in the entire history of existence. Uh, Moshe told Coin Journal that the m a more accurate valuation based on the token Carl sale was $47 million, which is based on the $2,350,000 raised in exchange for 5% of the company. The mycelium representatives added that the employees didn't know the company's actual revenue totals, but he also stated, I do believe our business revenue plan is solid, even if it's taking a while, as we're already about 3000 to 4000 a month in revenue, it's basically starting from scratch, and the number is growing. Uh, Quartz also shares a story that his time on the Air Force on a vacation in Spain, he paraphrased some comments from higher-ups and mycelium as follows. These lawyers you know, when we talk about making a token sale, they tell us this is illegal, we're going to jail. These lawyers, they believe everything needs to go by a template and we wanted to do something new. I just thought it was so weird that he was like joking about lawyers saying they were going to go to jail for this. In terms of these statements from the higher ups at Mycelium, uh, Marshak told Corn Journal it didn't happen. The IR hubs had lawyers work out to make sure the token sale was legal and the high legal cost of lawyers to work on all that. Unfortunately, it used up a lot of the funds raised too. So that, there's that. Um, not upset that they took a vacation, but I understand his sentiment where there's not an actual which a lot of these uh, ICOs and token sales that have been going on uh, don't really have an actual business plan. But I can understand the frustration of a number of different people when it comes to all this. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court to settle a major cell phone privacy case by Lawrence Hurley. Uh, police officers for the first time will be required to obtain warrants to get data on the past locations of criminal suspects based on Cell phone use under a major case on privacy rights in the digital age taken up by the U.S. Supreme Court on Monday. This is coming from Reuters. The judge, judge, the justice agreed to hear an appeal by a man convicted in a series of armed robberies in Ohio and Michigan with the help of past cell phone location data, who contends that without a warrant from a court, such data amounts to unreasonable search and seizure on the U.S. Supreme, the U.S. Constitution's Fourth Amendment. Uh, cell phone location records are becoming increasingly important to the to police and criminal investigations with authorities routinely requesting and receiving this information from wireless providers. Um, kind of skipping down here. So, the legal fight has raised questions about how much companies protect the rights of their customers. The four big fire, four big, the big four wireless carriers, Verizon Communication, AT&T, T-Mobile, and Sprint, receive tens of thousands of requests a year from law enforcement for what is known as cell site location information, and the requests are routinely granted. Uh, the Supreme Court has twice in recent years ruled on major cases concerning how criminal law applies to new technology. On each occasion, ruling against law enforcement. In 2012, the court held that the warrant is required to place a GPS tracking device on the vehicle. Two years later, the court said the police need a warrant to search a cell phone that is seized during an arrest. The information the law enforcement agencies can obtain from wireless carriers, so which local cell phone towers users connect to at the time they make calls. Police can use historical data to determine if the suspect was in the vicinity of the crime or real-time data to track the suspect. Uh, Carpenter's bid to suppress the evidence um, that the, the gentleman who has the appeal uh, failed and he was convicted of six robbery counts. On the appeal, the Cincinnati, Ohio-based Sixth U.S. Sixth, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld his conviction to finding that no warrant was required for the cell phone information. Civil liberty lawyers have said that the police need probable cause and therefore a warrant in order to avoid constitutionally unreasonable searches. So I think this is very, very important uh, considering for the space that we're in that a lot of uh, individuals utilize uh, many different apps and, mo and use their mobile device for either carrying or transaction transacting in the uh, cryptocurrency space. And given the crackdown that's been going on or occurring with um, various governments, it would be interesting to see 
how this falls out. Um, and in general, you know, they should just get warrants and stop, you know, taking shortcuts and the easy way out. Um, coin desk and, you know, basically violating people's rights. Uh, coin desk. Uh, Nevada becomes the f- first U.S. state to ban blockchain taxes. Uh, by Stan Higgins. Nevada has become the first state to ban local governments from taxing blockchain use. Coindesk reported yesterday that Nevada's legislation had cleared the bill first introduced in March and sent it to Governor Brian Sandoval for approval. Public records show that the Governor Sandoval approved the measure yesterday, ensuring it's enshrining it in state law. In addition to preventing local governments from taking the use of blockchain or smart contract or requiring a uh, licensure for the use, the bill stipulates if a law requires a record to be written, Submission of the blockchain, which uh, electronically contains the records satisfying the law, meaning the data f- from a blockchain can be introduced in proceedings. The measure enjoyed broad support in the Nevada legislative public records show. The Senate advanced it by a two- 21 to 0 vote in April, followed by the House representatives, which also passed it unanimously. And the second blockchain related bill to be signed in law in recent days. On May 29th, Arizona Governor Doug Ducey signed a bill that recognizes the legality of blockchain signatures and smart contracts. So, there's one going on in New Hampshire. There's some stuff going on in California. Um, I personally would like to see, uh, you know, the money transmitting licenses ease so we can have more peer-to-peer transactions occurring uh, within the states um, that is protected that maybe emphasize that you don't have to have a money transmitting license. And that way, you just need either fencing license or, or fencing compliant, if you will. Um, and this will allow for more um, transactions uh, when it comes to cryptocurrency in the state to occur, but we'll see. Um, the Indian government rec- to recommend Bitcoin regulation with six months. I'm not going to read the whole article here, but it's by Kevin Helms, June 20th. Uh, the Indian government will meet to discuss the regulatory framework of Bitcoin and other digital currencies next week, according to the local publication. Uh, Bitcoin.com talked with India's leading in Bitcoin exchanges to find out what to really expect from the medium. Um, so skipping along here. So, so what really to expect next week? In April, the government formed the community to investigate Bitcoin and expects its report next month. The committee also tasked with assessing the existing legal and regulatory framework of digital currencies in India as well as globally. Last month, the government sought public comments on the MyGov website about whether digital currencies should be regulated. The de- deadline of the comments was on May 30th. However, some continue to roll and even after the deadline, a total of 3,889 comments are shown on the website at press time. Uh, so Sathvik uh, Vishwata, CEO of the co-founder of the leading Bitcoin exchange in India, uh, Yukon, told Bitcoin.com, Now is the committee's turn to turn out the comments from stakeholders in the Bitcoin industry and comments from the general public, refer to the present laws and regulation, and finally propose a step forward. He added that it will, there won't be a decision as such, but a recommendation on, on based on what has been told to us in a closed-door meeting. A lot of government departments and other regulators are still warming up to Bitcoin, he said, noted the committee sought comments from us in closed-door meeting prior to seeking the public opinion. Meanwhile, the RBI has taken a, a, a wait-and-watch policy as a stance, a vision conveyed, even though the bank has issued a couple of public warnings against digital currency. Uh, yeah, the RBI is the Reserve Bank of India. Co-founder and leading Indian Indian. Uh, Bitcoin exchange Zbeth Hey uh, Sandeep uh, Gunaka occurs, concurs about the government's next step. He told Bitcoin.com they're setting up a task force which will take six months to come up with recommendations. So it's a very strong possibility that by the end of the year or beginning of next that the Indian government could, just like Japan, begin to accept Bitcoin as a payment which would be the best case scenario. The worst case scenario, you're going to start seeing some crackdowns and significant regulations. But let's hope for the best here. And lastly, uh, this is from Bits Online. Uh, Libertarians outraged after a party member jailed for using Bitcoin by Evan Fagart. The United States Libertarian Party has formally condemned the federal government after court sentenced a Louisiana man to four years in prison for using Bitcoin. Libertarian sentenced to prison for using Bitcoin. According to the press release from the Libertarian Party, LP, Louisiana-based member Randall Ward received a 46-month prison sentence for operating an unregistered money service business using Bitcoin. Condemned the federal government for their actions, the LP said that trading Bitcoin is perfectly legal. Major retailers such as Microsoft, Expedia, Dell, Overstock, and Whole Foods accept Bitcoin. 
The party went on to say the prosecutors targeted Lord for using Bitcoin without a license, which they claimed Lord did not need in the state of Louisiana. Additionally, the LP claimed the Lord filed for reg federal registration with FinCEN, but the bureaucrats misplaced his pa paperwork. In his press release, the party suggested that FinCEN purposely m misplaced Lord's paperwork in order to set him up for prosecution. Every aspect of the case is travesty, the press release said, moving on to liking Lord's case to Ross Ulbrich, who received a life sentence for operating Silk Road Marketplace on the dark net. The party also denounced the federal government for indirectly creating demand for Bitcoin and then attacking people trying to fill the financial gap left by government policies and monetary manipulation. In closing, libertarians called for an overturn of Lord's sentence, as well as a repeal of the ornious laws and regulations used against Lord. Lord was an active member of the U.S. Libertarian Party, even running for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives in 2012 and 2014. Regulatory confusion has led to legal trouble for Bitcoiners in the past. Uh, Lord's case echoes similar stories in other parts of the United States, most notably the case of Mitchell Espinoza in Florida, caused outrage in the Bitcoin community. Espinoza received money laundering charges for selling um, $1,500 worth of Bitcoin to undercover detectives. Those detectives reportedly told Espinoza that they intend to use the Bitcoin to purchase stolen credit card numbers. Uh, ultimately, Judge Teresa Murray Poehler threw out the case, ruling that Bitcoin did not fall under the category of money. Therefore, Espinoza could not receive punishment for using Bitcoin to launder money. Commenting on the vagueness of the Florida standing money laundering statute, Pooler wrote that the court is unwilling to punish a man for selling his property to another when his actions fall under a statute that is so vaguely written that even legal professionals have difficulty finding singular meaning. Uh, Lando Lord was not so lucky, however, and he will be spending the next four years in prison, much to the dismay of his friends in the Libertarian Party. So yeah, there's been a big crackdown. I don't know what this means for individuals and... Um, the local Bitcoin, uh, which is one of the biggest peer-to-peer -peer users, or even the decentralized exchanges like Bit BitSquare, uh, what this means for them. Um, if there's a continued crackdown on sellers, eventually you're going to get a crackdown on buyers. And that is it for the news. On to the discussion about Nord, um, not Nord, nodes, hardware, and decentralization. So this episode, we're trying to cover, you know, nodes and hardware, uh, what SPV, SPV wallets are, or SPV nodes, and decentralization. And these are key things that are brought up in the discussion when uh, discussing raising the block size debate. Uh, one of the core, ironically, uh, one of the core uh, consistent, or I should say, consistent arguments or knocks against raising the block size is, is that it's going to prevent decentralization. It's going to have all these centralized hubs, whether it be mining pools or even nodes that are in servers everywhere. Uh, it's going to change the very nature of Bitcoin. It's going to prevent it from being a decentralized system to a very highly centralized system. If you raise the uh, block size to the capacity where people, ordinary people cannot participate. Uh, the second thing is that it will be difficult just by the fear of technological advancements that we are at for people to participate. So not everyone can run a full node because it'll be either A, too expensive, or they don't have the hardware to do it. Uh, for example, right now you can run a full node on a Raspberry Pi, uh, two or three. Um, another thing is the miners. Miners might pull out and mine other cryptocurrency coins because it's much easier are not mine at all because the difficulty of, of mining a two megabyte uh, block size um, is very is much more difficult than uh, doing a one megabyte. Uh, they're going to have to reconfigure all the hardware, software, uh, redo everything for such an upgrade. And if you keep on increasing, you're going from four to from two to four to eight to sixteen, or on up, then um, Miners not might not be capable of keeping up with that. And for the mining aspect, I can see that because ASICs are very specialized chips. Um, if they're not configured to be capable of mining something higher than two megabytes or the difficulty rating gets too much for them, they, they might either over, overload or overclock and, and not function properly. For, for that aspect, I can almost see that. But this is something that's been discussed for years now to where... It's not an unknown variable for miners, and their return on investment is something that they can calculate. And many of them actually want the two megabyte uh, block size, which 
in of itself at this point is kind of temporary. If this was done like four years ago when it was first proposed or was first discussed, then then we would be talking about maybe a four or eight megabyte upgrade and we might be having a entirely different discussion. But right now it seems like the miners are prepared to do a two megabyte and the propagation out there into the network, um, the configuration, you know, uh, of pushing these out there from one node to another node to another node is not going to be as difficult as as um, the Bitcoin core people or those against raising the block size have been stating. The other thing it's kind of touchy is broadband. Uh, the dis distribution of, you know, the capacity to get on the internet at the, the speed and the quality is different in every country. Uh, that is kind of a meh argument because while it's very widely distributed, the access to the internet is becoming increasingly, increasingly much easier. Broadband is here. It's just a matter of time to get into places. And so that argument eh, is not as strong because within a year or two or three years, people are going to have, you, it's going to be ubiquitous, but broadband is going to be everywhere. Uh, even in third world uh, countries where uh, they may not have, broadband but the, the capacity you know there's so much effort going into wi-fi towers or satellites or cloud um not cloud but those um, hydrogen roof balloons and areas to even google's um proposal to have servers right off of uh you know internet farms right off of the coastlines of countries uh, so that it, you know there's more room and more capacity to distribute the internet but more importantly you don't have to build these um, high function um, server farms that have to worry about being cooled you're being cooled by the ocean um, all this is is coming to fruition so the capacity to on ramp and to get on and connect and having a strong connection that that's very weak the node argument is also a bit weak because hardware just it just drops every every year uh, every time you turn in your phone, every time you turn into your laptop or computer to one of those electronic places, it, it gets shipped down to the third world. It gets wiped, it gets cleaned out, it gets shipped down to the third, second world. It, it flourishes in those markets. So right now you can basically have a uh, two gig RAM um, computer, like almost a 10, 11 year old computer really and you can run a full node you, that's the ram capacity minimum to run a, a full bitcoin node mining is a different thing it's more specialized we're gonna touch on it a little bit on this episode but i think i'm gonna touch on what um why asics it's so difficult to get asic chips not just simply for economic reasons of the, the high demand but the uh actual creation of asics uh, we talked about it a little bit about it with the Chinese manufacturing. Why, that's why um, a lot of the mining pools are so heavily concentrated in China, even though they have the Great Great Wall. It's because uh, they manufacture most of the world's everything, manufacturing everything that goes on through China. So it's very easy for them to uh, pick up the equipment necessary for them to create mining pools. Plus, they also have a socialized system when it comes to electricity. So they have electricity, cheap electricity, easier access to to the equipment and the space and bam you have um, a highly concentrated and almost centralized uh, mining center if you will with all these different mining pools in china but let's talk about the nodes and get into it and see if there's any merits in you making the judgment for yourself here for our discussion so let's discuss what are uh, bitcoin nodes and why do we need them this comes from coindesk <clears throat> um, I'm kind of be skipping around here, so here we go. It's well known that Bitcoin is designed as a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. However, what's often lost in translation is the sheer amount of machinery that is needed to maintain this global infrastructure. For example, in order to validate and relay transactions, Bitcoin requires more than a network of miners processing transactions. It must broadcast the message across our network using nodes. This is the first step to transaction process that results in block confrontation. This function is full, is full in its full potential. The Bitcoin network must not only provide an avenue of transactions, but also remain secure. By using a number of randomly selected nodes, the network can reduce the problem of double spending when a user attempts to spend the same digital token twice. 
However, Bitcoin doesn't just need nodes. It requires lots of fully functioning nodes, nodes that have the Bitcoin Core client on the machine instant, instance with a complete blockchain. The more nodes there are, the more secure the network. This is one of the reasons that it's planned to put Bitcoin in space, and then and then the plan was important implication for Bitcoin. Um, that hasn't quite happened yet, but yeah, that was one of the discussions very early on. This was written in 2014. So, the problem is the number of nodes in the network is dropping, and core developers believe it may continue to do so. Looking at a 60-day chart of Bitcoin nodes shows that the number has grown significantly. It went from 10,000 reachable nodes in early March to 8,000, which has been the consistent amount of close to 8,000 for a number of years now. What's interesting is that during the recent 24-hour period, the number of reachable nodes went down from 8,200 to 7,600 and back to 8,200 again. This is just that a portion of the users running nodes are turning off their machines at night, meaning that this contingent of nodes are being run on desktops or laptops. Another issue is the geographic distribution of nodes. The majority of the reachable nodes are located in North America, which is very true and still is true today. In Africa, where Bitcoin could perhaps help uh, people lacking access to financial resources more than anywhere else. This is a regional is positive of reachable no nodes. And we'll talk we'll read an article about uh, one node operator in Africa. The lack of incentives. Unlike Bitcoin mining, where participants are rewarded for Bitcoin transactions, running a Bitcoin node does not provide an incentive. The only benefit of someone running to run a node is to help protect the network and based on the Bitcoin nodes data, the number of people interested in supporting the network with a full node is waning. There could be a number of reasons for that. For one thing, running a full node utilizes the resources of the machine, basically no monetary return. Plus, of the collapse of Mt. Gox has left, likely left many people with less desire to support the digital currency. Furthermore, the popularity of the Bitcoin Core client in China, where it was for a time immensely popular, has tapered off given to the contentious regulatory environment there. Uh, the centralization of mining. In terms of supporting the Bitcoin network, it used to be a lot easier to, for the average user to participate. However, the advent of massive ASIC data centers has weakened the consensual nature of mining, and by extension, providing nodes for many people. Uh, Ross uh, Melvick, a lead engineer of the Bitcoin incubator Boost VC, believes there will be larger operators with data centers like KNC Miner that will have to pick up the slack in the number of Bitcoin node reasons. Uh, KC Miner is just an example of economic logistics in the mining industry, pushing Bitcoins towards a more centralized future. Uh, Mega also believes that the major technology companies that take interest in Bitcoin will have to put their computing resources behind the digital currency, which they have done. Uh, a lot of a majority of the Bitcoin companies out there run their own nodes or a series of Bitcoin nodes. A part of the Bitcoin core development team, Mike Curran, sees the issue of nodes dropping from 10,000 down to 7 uh, a significant problem. To her, on the core of the issue is this interest in both expending computing resources and electricity towards something that may be diminishing in value. Um, that so much hasn't been what the case is. I think for what really has been consistently, because right now you, nodes have gone up to around 7,000 up to as high as 8,000, is the feasibility of running a full node, of downloading the node, of being able to, um, let's see, uh, the ease of usage. They have, they, they have built some, there have been some Bitcoin node, full Bitcoin node machines. We did a review of a company that was in that business on 21 Co. But they're expensive. They're, they're more, they're about as expensive as a computer. Um, and the fact that when running a full node, you're not also mining at the same time, which used to be the thing that you could do, and so you can earn a little bit, uh, is also not a case. So there's not any return of investment, if you will. But I think really what it is, is fundamentally, uh, the core thing is usability. If it made it very easy to download the blockchain, to place it onto a computer and run it 24-7 and it's not an issue or a problem, um, your, your computer is not going to get super hot or something like that. It's not going to take up too much space. Then I think more and more people would utilize it. I, I think really if they were, if people were to develop and build full node machines, they need to price it, I think, somewhere around below Xbox prices for people to, in order to pick one up and participate in the network. And the article comes on a little bit further, so here we go. On to the next one. So one of the things that people have proposed out there to kind of get more Bitcoin nodes is should they get rewarded like miners? This is something that Dash does and a couple other cryptocurrencies have done is that if you run a node 
are certain types of nodes uh, with the case of Dash, if you run a master node, you get rewarded. So here we go, Bitcoin.com. Uh, this is from Jamie Redman. Should full Bitcoin nodes get rewarded like miners? It's February 11th, 2016. And before we read this article, we need to talk about what a full node is. So a full Bitcoin node, and this is from Bitcoin w Wicca, is a computer that connects to the Bitcoin no network is called a node. The node that, f that fully enforces all the rules of the Bitcoin are called full nodes. Most nodes on the network are lightweight nodes instead of full nodes, but full nodes form the backward the backbone of the network and lightweight nodes are the SVV nodes and we'll talk about them when we talk about that but full nodes have the, the entire blockchain they they have the entire blockchain the entire history and each transaction that they receive each block they receive they check the entire chain each and every single time that's what makes it a full node um, so here we go Full nodes download every black and block and transactions and check them against the Bitcoin Bitcoin Core's consensus rules. Here are examples of consensus rules, that, though there are many more. Uh, blocks may only create a certain number of Bitcoins. Uh, currently, that is 12.5 uh, BTC per block. Transactions must have a correct signature for the Bitcoins per being spent. Transactions slash blocks must be in the correct data format. And within a single blockchain, a transaction output cannot be double spent. So if a transaction or a block violates the consensus rule, then it's absolutely rejected, even if every other node on the network thinks it's valid. This is one of the most important characteristics of full nodes. They do what's right no matter what. For full nodes, miners actually have fairly limited power. They can only reorder or remove transactions and only be expending a lot of computing power. A powerful miner is able to execute some serious attacks, but because full nodes rely on miners only for a few things, miners cannot completely change or destroy Bitcoin. So since basically the nodes are the ones that, you know, validate the rules, even if miners were to do things like, I don't know, split the chain or uh, try attempt to do a double spin, the nodes will reject that. And with a split, you know, you'll see a split in the nodes, split in the hashing power, and depending on where all the nodes go, or even with the miners, you know, going one way, um, that's why we have the user activated soft fork. Uh, you can have one chain being stronger than the other. And we'll get into that when we discuss SegWit and SegWit2x. But nodes that have different consensus rules are actually using two different network currencies. Changing any of the consensus rules requires a hard fork, which can be thought of as creating new currency and having everyone move it. Consensus rules are different from policy rules, which specify how a node or miner prioritizes or discourages certain things. Policy rules can be changed freely, and different nodes have different policy rules. Because all full nodes must use exactly the same consensus rules in order to remain compatible with each other, even duplicate bugs and oddities in the original consensus rules, creating full nodes from scratch is extremely difficult and dangerous. It's therefore recommended that everyone who wishes to run a full node use the software based on the reference client, which is the only client guaranteed to behave correctly. At minimum, a full node must download every transaction that's ever taken place, all new transactions, and all block headers. Additionally, full nodes must store information about every unspent transaction output until it's spent. By default, full nodes are inefficient in that they download each new transaction at least twice and they store the entire blockchain forever, even though the only unspent transaction outputs are required. Performances can be improved by enabling blocks only in mode and enabling proing. Proing kind of just gets rid of unspent transactions. Archival nodes. A subset of full nodes also accepted incoming corrections and uploaded old blocks to other peers in the network. This happens in the software and runs in listens as in default. And contrary to some popular misconception, being an archival node is not necessarily being a full node. If a user's bandwidth is constrained, then they, they can use listen zero. If the disk space is constrained, they can use pruning. All the while still being a fully validated node that enforces Bitcoin's consensus rules and contributing to Bitcoin's overall security. So here we go with the art back to the article. So <clears throat> running a Bitcoin node. The permissionless distributed ledger used in the Bitcoin is a chain of communication and requires nodes to validate actions within its protocol. They're essentially the ecosystem just as much as miners who are finding blocks processing data. There are currently let me see. The article has 5,796 nodes. Uh, let's check with Bit21 Bit to see how many nodes there are right now. Acting as connectors and reducer points to fully confirmed transactions on the block. 
There are 7,663 nodes currently as of today, June 26th of recording. Uh, BitTorrent is a protocol that's very similar to how, how the digital currency operates. The system's giant collaboration of home computers, servers, and hosts acting as nodes to help lighten the weight of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. This helps the BitTorrent -tor network become resilient from attack and speed up its process. In the Bitcoin network, the actions of home computers and servers hosting full nodes also protects the currency from a single point of failure. Uh, running a Bitcoin node comes with a few requirements and also some costs at times if it runs consistently. This includes electricity operating the hosting device, the blockchain is kept on the cost of a cons constant internet connection running the software, and desktops can perform the function of hosting a node like Windows, Mac, and various Linux operating systems. Uh, it can also be held on so smaller devices that are capable of holding the entire blockchain with enough memory to perform the functions. Gadgets like Inspix's Raspberry Pis can also house a distributed ledger when the Bitcoin protocol is applied to the operating system. Uh, full nodes need at least, I um, believe it's uh, 100 plus gigs of storage space and two gigabytes of memory RAM to keep up with the network. I recommend a six hour running time per day suggested by forums and community members uh, concerning the subject. Uh, yeah, you can run for six hours to have a full node access, but that, the issue again is like an on and off light switching and it can lead to some vulnerabilities for, for the security of the network. Uh, you might as well just run the, the beast uh, for 24 hours, if you will. 24 hours, seven days a week, so forth. The more nodes that are within the network, the more trustless and decentralized the system becomes. The validation provided by these nodes ensures that the double spending doesn't happen and all the protocols adhere to. Bitcoin miners are offered an incentive to, to process transactions which include freshly created digital coins as well as transaction fees. Rewarding full nodes. Certainly there's no incentive to running a full node within the ecosystem, but some have thought in ways to handle the method by offering reward. There have been ideas to add this incentive to the code itself and other solutions outside the blockchain's operation. Theoretically, a reward for running a full node by an individual would help boost the network as security and speed up the verifications. Not only can individuals host a node, but companies and organizations can also participate in securing the network. Recently, the Bitcoin exchange, BTCC, has helped the network by hosting 100 dispersed full nodes worldwide. Last January, the payment processor, BitPay, announced its new feature service with Microsoft Azure Blockchain as a service or BAS platform, which enable individual users Organizations run a full Bitcoin node on a distributed cloud. Other companies, such as 21Co, um, enable the company to run nodes, and there's also all coins that want to incentivize the network as well, um, which is Dash. For example, Spreadcoin is a token that uses what the creators call a proof of a Bitcoin node that adds a reward to those operating a, a full Bitcoin node. Uh, nodes also help form a consensus. The node count at over 5,000 and far below the all-time high of above 10,000. This has caused some concern and some of the reasons why people are discussing and offering rewards. With the block size debate, nodes running a different uh, Bitcoin client are also helping bring consensus to the infrastructure with hard or soft fork implementation. Currently, some users have started running nodes for Bitcoin Classic, Unlimited, and XT, and now um, BIP148. These alternative code structures could decide the new rules for the system, including increasing the block size. Miners and those running full nodes will be part of the voting process during a code change when the majority comes to consensus. That means that either the Bitcoin Classic or another version could be the protocol used over core. Uh, Bitcoin Classic is not in the running. Basically, it's SegWit2x or uh, the user-activated software, which is Bit148. So currently at this year, to run a full Bitcoin node, uh, this is from Bitcoin.com again, by Justin uh, Connell, how much does it cost to run a full Bitcoin node? A full going, okay, we already know what that is. So to run a node today, one needs generally 125 gigabytes of free disk space, two gigabytes of memory RAM, a, a broadband internet connection with upload speeds at least uh, 40 kilobytes or 50 kilobytes per second, and a connection with sufficient download limits. Bitcoin nodes commonly use 200 gigabytes upload or more a month and download around 20 gig gigabytes per month. So you pre pretty much can run this on your, any kind of data plan if you had like a mobile device um, to get your internet. The Bitcoin blockchain is currently 113 gigabytes in size. This is uh, as of February of this year. Active Reddit, Redditor uh, Beijing Bitcoins calculated two months ago how much it cost for him to run a node. He used a two-year-old Lemonone uh, T44 ThinkPad with an Intel i5 4 
gigabyte of RAM and 500 gigabyte uh, HDD uh, drive. The machine runs uh, $549 brand new on a Bitcoin accepted Newegg, which no longer accepts Bitcoin any longer. And refurb with 8 gigabytes of RAM runs just uh, $340. His internet bill runs $500, uh, not $500, $55 per month. So the register uh, conjecture setup is uh, 48 gigawatts per day or 175 gigawatts per year. He pays 26 cents per gigawatt, so the node only costs him about 12 and a half cents to run per day. That's $374 per month or $45 55 cents per year for electricity alone, which really is not a lot. If you think about that, how many cups of coffee is that? You know, you, that's a going to the movies with two people, getting, you know, popcorn, soda for each person, a hot dog, and some candy. Uh, for Dorla, another Reddit detail two years ago how you ran a Bitcoin node on Amazon's web service for. 20 bucks per month, not bad, he wrote, and I'm happy to do this for a while, giving back my gains in BTC. And Reddit user uh, Million Dollar Bitcoin compiled a Bitcoin Unlimited on Raspberry Pi 1 Model B with 520 12 megabytes. It runs nearly 100% average load, and runs no other processes, and draws 2 watts of power. Some users detail procuring a virtual pr private server for 5 to 10 bucks a month, though this is less desirable. People generally encourage Bitcoiners to run nodes to increase the network's decentralization, and the nodes that run 24-7 are needed to make sure the blockchain is always available somewhere. And the cheapest possible hardware. Uh, Bitcoin Cash Satoshi documented Reddit how he ran a Bitcoin full node for just 130 bucks. The Reddit used a mini PC found on uh, AliExpress. The PC featured a NS, uh, N3150 Celeron Quad Crow processor known for low consumption, and the user added an 8 gigabyte of unused RAM and a 500 gigabyte HDD drive. Others have discussed now an, an appropriately outfitted Raspberry Pi runs for just 90 bucks and can be used as a full Bitcoin node. Uh, we'll talk about that when we talk a little bit more about um, hardware next. Potential Bitcoin node operators can be priced out in the market in much of the developed world. Most single nodes will likely continue to come from the developed world, with the remainder being server farms as envisioned by Satoshi. Satoshi. Nodes help to maintain Bitcoin's decentralization. If not enough nodes are running, clients won't easily connect through the peer-to-peer -peer network that com comprises Bitcoin. The centralized service will have to be substituted for its operation. There are, to be certain, potential risks running a Bitcoin node. Depending on the digital currency's legality in the jurisdiction where one resides, particularly in an unstable nations of the developing world. If you already have a computer, a hard drive, or internet connection, then running a node is easy. Indeed, many node operators even use their daily desktop computers to run the Bitcoin network. Uh, currently, I already talked about how many nodes there are. The top five nations in the United States, Germany, France, Netherlands, and Canada are the, the biggest of the node operators. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the loan operator. This is from Motherboard. I'm not going to read the whole title, I just find it very fascinating. Meet the man running the only Bitcoin node in West Africa uh, by Corne Faif. A Nigerian developer uh, this came out February 9th of this year, wants to start building the Bitcoin network in the region. Stash away somewhere in Lagos and the lonely piece of Bitcoin software running on a server in a data center in the Nigerian capital is the only reachable Bitcoin node of this type, not just in the country, but almost all of Western and Central Africa without a companion for thousands of miles in every direction. The node is Lagos is owned and run by 35-year-old software developer Tim Akanubu, who said that his interest in Bitcoin stems from the gaps in the, in the African financial ecosystem. Moving money from one country to another in Africa can be very tough, uh, Arupa says in, Sky, in a Skype call. Right now, it's easier for you to send money to the U.S. than it is to send to another African country. And I saw Bitcoin as a technology that can really change that. Uh, Bitcoin nodes, okay, we already know what Bitcoin nodes are, so... Akabu chose to run his own node to learn about the workings of the cryptocurrency in depth and contribute to the sync of the network as a whole. For reasons of price and practicality, most Nigerians are unlikely to choose this option. Akabu's server costs are 10000 Nigeria per month or $32 in a country where the GPT per capita is only around 3000 but nonetheless it's part of his growing interest in Bitcoin in the country overall. So this is where you get um, the pushback for running full nodes and even um, 
the mining and for the upgrade is that it's economically not feasible for the rest of the world to do this. This is a lot of money for them. $32 per month is significant for someone to be able to do something that's considered very basic in the um, first world or western world areas. And all we're going to do is drive this cost up to where they, to where people such as uh, Akanubu would not be able to participate. Uh, last year we had an explosion in the use of Bitcoin in Nigeria. At the end of the year I got a call from my dad asking where he could buy Bitcoin from. That's when I knew it was reached the mainstream. The number of factors combined in the 2016 to, to spark this uptake. The devaluation of the Nair against the dollar ramped inflation and the proliferation of investment schemes that encourage people to buy cryptocurrency to the point that the Nigerian Securities and Exchange Commission is now actively warned against them. Meanwhile, African banks have been looking to fintech startups to help them harness the power of Bitcoin, hoping to gain some of the market share that has been lost to telecom providers in the money transmission sector. Whatever the reason, many Nigerians decided to start learning more about the cryptocurrency and listings on local Bitcoin sites now show a healthy number of buyer, buying and selling offers in Nigeria. Bitcoin's growing adoption in Nigeria has paralleled the situation in countries like Venezuela, where some citizens have turned to Bitcoin as an alternative means of transaction online in the face of massive inflation and perceived financial mismanagement of the government. If, as in Venezuela, the trends in the Nigerian economy continue to make Bitcoin investment attractive, uh, Tim Akabu might, might not have the only node in West Africa much, for much longer. So it's because of the cost, and a lot of it has to do with just the economic realities in other parts of the world to where they cannot participate, even at the current state of Bitcoin, at the full participational level um, that's necessary to secure the network and be really, truly get the full benefits of participating in cryptocurrencies, You know, whether it be able to mine, whether it be to run a full node, um, a business, peer-to-peer uh, -peer tra transactions, establish exchange, participate in exchange. It's not feasible or possible because uh, the economic realities have priced them out and if by raising the block size from one megabyte to two megabytes it's just going to only increase that cost for them. But the other, ec the other argument is that um, because technology does get cheaper um, these regions are actually developing the, the Unwrapping them is going to be much easier if by the time they do reach to where they can fully participate, they have the full capacity and hardware uh, to participate um, within the Bitcoin network because technology just, they're skipping a lot of stuff. They're not laying down cable lines. They have, you know, cell phone towers. Uh, they're going, they're skipping a lot of the different stuff that other first world countries are doing and going straight to the latest technology to where they might be able to participate at some point fully uh, within the network, if you will. Um, that there will be an intersection, if you will. And that this, this is not enough to stop um, raising the block size debate, the, the trade-off, if you will. So let's talk a little bit about hardware. Um, I think I'm going to do a separate episode of just specifically on ASIC chips. But ASIC chips are pretty much the go-to mechanism to mine Bitcoin. Um, you can purchase your ASIC pick chip and you can um, DIY it to a Raspberry Pi board. And we'll talk about Raspberry Pis in a moment. And you can basically run a full node and mine at the same time, uh, which was basically what the 21Co uh, Bitcoin machine was, which was a full node Bitcoin machine that also mined. Or you can um, create your own kind of mining apparatus. Some people um, very early on, but I guess some people still may do so. You can bring a, a series of GPUs together and create your own mining rig. These got very expensive. It's like 200 to 700 bucks a pop um, at the height of the GPU craze. Uh, GPUs are still hard to get to get because of Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies that you are able to mine with GPUs. But because of the economic value of Bitcoin and because um, the industry has basically revolve of specializing their machines for the purpose of mining Bitcoin, you have the ASICs. And the ASIC chips um, are very expensive. Uh, a Bitcoin machine is very expensive. Uh, we talked about it a little bit about the Chinese miners with Antminer um, and Bitmain, you know, being the biggest kahunas in the block. Um, it can run from, you know, something as low as $49. You're not going to get much out of that bit, you know, bit mining machine to something that's almost $2,000. Uh, for you to be able to mine. So this really does price out people um, 
in the market already. And then, as we're discussing all along, if you raise a block size limit, you know, you're going to have to reconfigure these mining machines. Uh, you may even have to redo the AC chips themselves to be able to handle the increased block size. And the capacity, all the electricity, the computational power that's necessary to uh, mine for Bitcoin uh, increases. And because of their increases, it increases, you know, the cost of mining and the return on investment is not as great. So you might not have as many mining pools or miners out in existence. In fact, what you will have is basically anyone who has the biggest amount of money will be, could potentially already, con you know, control the network. Uh, this is something that's a little bit been going on with the whole um, China, uh, where the biggest mining pools are located in China and they control uh, like 80% of the hashing power altogether if they were to collude and combine together, which is somewhat what they're kind of doing with the agreement to back uh, SegWit uh, 2X, is that they agreed to put their hashing power behind that. Then your, your viewpoint could be that that's consensus if they agreed together. But at the same time, um, if you're against it or for it, or if you're looking for more a diversified, uh, decentralized um Hashing power, not having most of your hashing power in China is not a good thing, especially with the Chinese firewall, which is becoming an issue. It's one of the big things that some people are not for the one megabyte because then you have to go through the China wall in order to be able to propagate out to the network and it slows down times. Uh, also, the Chinese government has been doing some crackdowns with exchanges in their banking infrastructure. Um, they're also talking to miners, so there's there's a lot of things that could happen when you have a year, you know, most of your mining power in one in one spot, if you will. And it, well, Bitcoin would not disappear if the mining pools were sh to shut down, but its hashing power would dramatically drop, and security of the network could be at a, at a vulnerability, if you will. So because of these things, uh, one one of the things that the potential things is. If you raise the block size, if you raise it so high, you're going to price people out and participate in the network. The counter thing is that, and we talked about it, we're going to continue talking about it, is if money fees are, you know, the money fees are so high as it is right now with these low blocks, uh, where you're, you have to spend either one to five fees, I've seen as high as $6 to get your transaction through, then you've already priced out. <laughs> like pretty much 75% of the world cannot afford to do that. They just can't. Uh, they don't have the economic means when you're, you know, you are living off of $5 a day and you have to sit, spend $5 to send your money. That's, that's not how, um, it's not very effective. It's not what, what helps people really. Now the counter argument to this whole propagation of mining on hardware is that it's not going to centralize or it may centralize for the moment, but there'll be diversification, if you will. And the reason being is <clears throat> that people are going to get into it. Uh, they are, they're going to put their money or their economic might um, into, into the network because they're going to get a return on investment. Someone's going to figure something out. Uh, with nodes, it's much easier to figure out that the hardware of downloading the chain and having it on a computer or something as small as a Raspberry Pi, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, it's feasible. People can participate in that aspect of the network. Uh, the mining aspect, I can see to a point where some, where there's some validity to the argument about raising the block size. <laughs> While there may be a slight drop drop in miners overall, I don't think there'll be a slight drop in mining pools. I think people forget that the say that miners have on the overall Bitcoin network, and while Initially, maybe the return on investment might not be as great. Over time, it, it's, it's going to wash out. Uh, you make the investment, you adjust to the new network. People are going to start transacting um, at the greater volume that they had before because it has dropped to, is dropped to some point. Uh, because of the mining fees, there's not as many transactions going across the network as before because no one wants to pay the one five and ten you know ten dollar or six dollar uh, mining fee plus you you want people to utilize your system you want people to utilize the network of bitcoin you don't want people just holding if people are just holding and are not transacting across the network then you're not getting any mining fees 
you're not getting any blocks propagating. There's just a standstill, if you will, or even a bit of a stagnation. So I think there will be miners and mining pools. I don't believe, I think what it is, is there, there has to be a concerted effort on the part of the community to diversify um, ASIC companies. Um, I think there's many that are on-ramping now that really just propagating and coming to the system. They just haven't been um, very popularized. Maybe it's a marketing issue. Maybe it's an expense issue. I think there needs to be a way for um, ASICs to get out there at a greater level than they have uh, previously up to this point. As far as operating nodes, uh, again, I have a, a link in the show notes, and it's about Raspberry Pi. You can run a full node on a Raspberry Pi. You can even run a full node on a Raspberry Pi, even with the, the block size going up to 2 megabytes. Uh, these things are pretty robust and uh, strong little uh, systems. And if you're unfamiliar with a Raspberry Pi, it is a computer board chip. It's just a very small computer board chip. It's like less than 40 bucks. Uh, they're up to version 3. They even have a Raspberry Pi Wi-Fi. So there's four versions of the, the Raspberry Pi out there. And... Basically, they're just a small computer board that you can do all these different number of complex or simple functions. It's a very DIY type of a deal. And what people have done is they've taken the Raspberry Pi um, and they've made it into a full node. So I'm going to read a little bit from a guide here. So how to create your own Bitcoin full node with a Raspberry Pi. Why a Bitcoin full node? Uh, it explains what Bitcoins are. So the tutorial will describe how to create a Bitcoin full node, a Bitcoin server that contains the full blockchain and propagates transactions throughout the Bitcoin network via peers. The system will not mine Bitcoins. It will play its part to keep the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network healthy and strong. For a detailed explanation for why it's important to have a healthy Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network, read this article about Bitcoin full nodes. And please note that this will be a headless server, meaning we do not use a GUI to configure Bitcoin or check to see how things are running. In fact, once the server is set up, you only interact with it using the command line calls or SSH. The idea was to have this full node be simple, low power, and something that just runs in your basement, closet, etc. Why Raspberry Pi? Uh, Raspberry Pi is an inexpensive computing hardware platform that generates little heat, draws little power, and runs uh, silently 24 hours a day with having, without having to think about it. So that's very key versus like a server or a um, a desktop or even a laptop if you were to take an old one or you use the one you currently have and uh, upload a uh, you know not upload but download a uh, the blockchain on it and use it as a uh, full node background I decided to create my own Bitcoin full node on a Raspberry Pi my Raspberry Pi full node is up and running performing well has about 75 peers and is relaying transactions to the Bitcoin network I did have to say ever since I got it set up it's been low maintenance I'm going to assume that if you're reading this to create your own Raspberry Pi Bitcoin full node, then you already know a little bit about Linux, electronics, or running command line tools on SHH. So what you need is um, Raspberry 2 Model B, uh, which is 40 bucks. The Raspberry Pi case is 5 and micro SD card with 64 gigabytes of storage is $25. A micro USB charger that you can dedicate to the Raspberry Pi, which is 8 for a total of 80 bucks. An Ether Cat 45 cable, assuming you have one around somewhere, that can be anywhere from 10 to, uh, you know, 6 to 20 bucks, depending on the quality of the Ether cable. So all in all, you can run this for, you know, less than 100 bucks. <clears throat> so, and then it goes step by step at how to prepare the micro SD card, installing the operating system, configuration, um, setting it up. Um, it takes a little bit to set up, sideload the blockchain. In my experience, the Raspberry Pi 2 with its 1 gigabyte of RAM and quad processors were not able to synchronize the blockchain on its own. Once it gets about to block 300,000, it starts to run out of RAM and all the coaxing in the world doesn't help. Note, one reader of this guide explained that you can control the RAM usage by starting the Bitcoin server with the following commands. Um, if you want to give it a try, start it up. Uh, the Bitcoin server using that switch and see if it will allow you to synchronize the blockchain without running out of RAM. Again, just my experience, and newer versions of Bitcoin may resolve this issue. Solution. Synchronize the blockchain on your primary chain, and then simply copy your, copy your personal seed of the Bitcoin blockchain to your Raspberry Pi full node. Uh, the files you need are in the blocks folder and chain state folder. You can use the following command using STP to move the files from your main computer to your Raspberry Pi full node. Now you're able to start up your Bitcoin server again and start relaying Bitcoin transactions in real time. Just execute the Bitcoin server command.
make sure the port forwarding is turned on in your router. One more quite important thing, you need to enable port forwarding, forwarding on your router to point to your port 83333 to your internal Bitcoin full node IP address. Uh, I'm not sure if you need both TCP or UDP forwarding, but I don't. I did both and everything's working great. And how do you do this? Each router is different and each cable slash fiber, fiber DSL provider has instructions somewhere. The router, in fact, might automatically do it for you since gaming machines like Xbox and PlayStation benefit from port forwarding and ISPs don't want to deal with explaining how to set it up. So the auto-detecting service you're running that need port forwarding might make it happen. Uh, why do you need port forwarding? Basically allows other Bitcoin peers to automatically connect to you without the need for you to invite them first. Without port forwarding, you would have fewer far fewer peers and not allow the Bitcoin network to be healthy. So much so they cannot rely, really claim that you're running a full node without port forwarding or a wide open IP enabling. So this is a pretty simple step. So you still have to have um, a bit of understanding of computers to run it. But for less than a hundred bucks um, and for a system that is very, all these parts are very widely distributed globally, I should say, you can get these. Uh, you can do something like this. But one of the digs against this is that um, the purpose of Bitcoin is not so that someone can run a Raspberry Pi as a node. So like this person wrote in their, in their um, run up, it only had the Raspberry Pi 2 only has one um, gig of RAM. I believe the Raspberry Pi 3 is up to two. I believe you have a minimum of two RAMs in order to two gig of RAM computer to order to participate with a uh, Bitcoin server so something that's like maybe a 10 year old computer it's mostly a highly highly recommended if, if you're going to do it because you go to four four gig ram uh, makes things easier makes things um, run much smoother um, you wouldn't have to clear out stuff but basically if you were to do a two gig ram bitcoin node then that's the only thing that you'd be running uh, you couldn't be doing anything else on that computer if you were using it for something else But again, one of the knocks about people um, talking about up, you know, upgrading the one megabyte, the purpose of the network is to move forward. When new hardware, new devices, new technology comes out, Bitcoin needs to adjust. And you can't uh, be held back simply because you want to use a neat uh, credit card size Raspberry Pi to run a full node. Uh, people need to be using you know, desktops and you use, use servers and you use laptops and invest their capital into these things so they can participate and run a full, complete node. So let's talk about a little bit about the problems of nodes, and then we'll go to SVV wallets and then decentralization. So what may be the problems that people experience when either running full nodes or mining rigs? Um, so let's touch on it a little bit here. Well, one is legality. If a cryptocurrency is, or Bitcoin is not legal, within your given country, then you operating a node or a mining rig would also be an illegal act. And that's occurred, uh, there's instances that have occurred in Venezuela, um, Ecuador, it's illegal to have Bitcoin. Um, it's not considered a valid cryptocurrency or money or anything like that. So you have to have that type of uh, caution and check within your own rules within your country to see if you can even operate you know, and participate within the network because there have been crackdowns and we'll talk about the crackdowns about certain types of activities that are occurring within the Bitcoin space. So there's some concern there with it when it comes to running these different types of hardware um, applications like a full node or a mining rig. The other is, is just, you know, the capital. Uh, obtaining the capital for a lot of people, especially when it comes to mining rigs and um, as I stated in the mining rigs section of this episode, uh, we'll talk about the ASIC chips in and of itself where you can't really DIY ASIC chips like you can with nodes. You know, that, 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 that's a, a dilemma. You know, you don't have the, the million dollar investment to have a warehouse full of mining rigs. You might not even have the 900 or even $400 to get just a simple mining hardware device that you can attach to either to your computer or to a server or run on its own. So there, there's those dilemmas or it is not really economically feasible for a lot of people, globally speaking, to participate fully and completely within um, the network. And also, uh, what many people consider to be full nodes are nodes that uh, not just, you know, 
run the blockchain and add and participate in that aspect, but also mine at the same time. Because initially when uh, the first client was released, you could you know, participate in the network with a full node and mine uh, Bitcoin at the same time because it was using CPU power. And then you can use GPUs. Uh, but that's not the case anymore. And there are devices, um, I've linked a, f- a few in the show notes, um, that you could uh, obtain to do that. Uh, there was a tip uh, by the, my review of 21Co to do that where you have a um, full node device that also mines. <clears throat> but that's not really necessarily feasible. If you're going to pull out your desktop, if you're going to pull out your Raspberry Pi, you're going to have to add an ASIC chip somehow or uh, a series of GPUs to order to have that aspect to it. So there's that particular issue. And then in general, when it comes to, as far as the community goes, when it comes to running nodes, is there's this um, networking law called Metcliff, Metcalfe's Law. And I was getting this from the Wicca. And it states the value of a telecommunication network is proportional to the square of number of connected users on the system, so it's uh, n to the square. The first formulated by the in this form by George uh, Gadir in 1993 and attributed to Robert Metcalf in regard to Ethernet. Metcalf law was originally presented in 1980, not in terms of users, but rather in compatibility communication devices. For example, fax machines, telephones, etc. Only later, with the globalization of internet, did the law carry over to users and networks, as its original intent was to describe Ethernet purchases and connections. The law is also very related to economics and business management, especially with competitive companies looking to merge with one another. So, uh, Metcalfe's law characterized many of the network fe- effects of communication technology and networks, such as internet, social network, and World Wide Web. Um, former chairman of the U.S. Federal Communication Commission, Reed Content, said the law gives the most understanding to the workings of the internet. Metcalfe, Metcalfe's law is related to the fact that the number of unique connections to the network and the number of nodes can be expressed mathematically as the triangular number of n, parentheses, n minus 1, parentheses, um, over, over 2, which is proportional to n to the square um, astronomically. That is an element of, okay, I'm not going to do these math problems. Uh, the law has also been illustrated using the example of fax machine. A single fax machine is useless, but the value of every fax machine increases with the total number of fax machines in the network. Because the total number of people with whom each user may send and receive documents increases. Likewise, in social networks, the greater number of users with services, the more valuable the service becomes into the community. So, having this being applicable to um, Bitcoin, what you have is that the more nodes that people operate, the stronger the network is and much easier is for users to utilize the network. The more mining pools there are, more miners there exist, um, the more distributed it is globally, uh, the stronger the network is, the, the more people that can utilize the system. And that is the issue when it comes with um, Bitcoin, when it becomes the modes, to the nodes and the mining rigs. If it becomes even increasingly more difficult, as some people have um, postulated with um, these different proposals, like raising the, the block size, that people will be boxed out and they can't participate in the network, and the nodes will drop. Um, mining become more difficult, and miners might mine other cryptocurrencies, or and so the hashing power of Bitcoin network will drop. Then that's that's a dilemma. That is a problem, if you will. Now, whether or not that is completely true or not, um, as we discussed in the nodes in the mining section. Um, Technology has gotten to the point where, you know, everything drops. Everything gets, you know, faster, better, stronger, um, and cheaper. So technology and hardware has accelerated to a point to where people can still participate within the network and the nodes. Maybe not so much in mining, and maybe within time that will in itself has dropped. Some of the pricing has dropped, but will be dropping as more cryptocurrencies come into the space, I think, and the usage or the need for specialized ASICs uh, becomes a bit more profitable if someone's able to develop them, you know, faster and cheaper and still can do the functions. Um, I think that you will see that type of breakthrough, if you will, were to occur, then you'll see mining drop, uh, the mining hardware price dropping, and you will see more people participating 
in that aspect of the network because it is profitable to mine. Um, it's also it also helps secure the network. And I think I'm gonna when we talk um, to the way of Bitcoin, how participating in the network of Bitcoin, you might not necessarily have to be so concerned with the ROI, you know, return on investment. And that's one of the key factors here with a lot of the the, the counter proposals to um, raising the block size is that people aren't don't have the economic incentive. And I think they're missing some of the social aspects of Bitcoin where they might socially want to participate in net, in, within the network and knowing that it's a wash, that it is not relevant to them if they make money on running a full node because you don't, you're not incentivized to run a full node. Even if you have the ASIC chip and you're mining, it's very, at this point, you know, signal mining or even participating in a pool is very nominal return. Uh, that's not the point of them participating. The point of them participating is they're participating with the community. They're participating within a network. They're securing Bitcoin. They're doing what they feel is the best um, means of securing the system that they utilize. And that's why they're participating. That's their way of contributing. And that there's no economic value really. It's more of a social value. It's even if, it, if you think of it as a more of a long-term value. If you're like a single miner or running a full node you're securing whatever cryptocurrency you currently have and as long as there's a strong network then your coin has value if there's a weak network and there's vulnerabilities and double spending and the hashing power diminishes then your coins in and itself diminish so it would be behoove to you to participate in such a fashion to secure that network to participate in a way that ensures that your coins still have value in the in the long term so before we move on to what um, SPVs are, let's clear up a, few, a bit of some of the misconceptions about full nodes. So this comes from the Wicca. It's um, a little dated. It's from 2016. I'm not reading the entire article, but there's a link in the show notes. But So here's a couple of the myths. Uh, the number of the nodes matter and, and, and or it's too low. So... Nodes with open ports are useful to the Bitcoin network because they help bootstrap new nodes by uploading historical blocks. Uh, they are measuring the number of redundant copies of the blockchain available for synchronizing. There have been no shortage of bandwidth capacity for simply syncing wallets from available nodes. And if there were, bandwidth might be added by renting cloud servers. Trust, security, and privacy are what, what matters right now. Full nodes are able to check that all Bitcoin rules are being followed. Rules will that like following the inflation schedule, no double spending, no spending in coins that don't belong to the holder of the private key, and all other rules required to make Bitcoin work, i.g. difficulty. Full nodes are what make Bitcoin trustless. No longer do you have to trust a financial institution like a PayPal bank or PayPal. You simply run a software on a computer. To put it simple, the, on the only nodes that matter is the one you use. I admit, there's no incentive to run nodes. The network relies on altruism. It's very much the individual Bitcoin user's rational self-interest to run a full node and use it as their wallet. Trustless. Uh, running a full node as your wallet is the only way to know for sure that none of your Bitcoin rules have been broken. Rules like no coins were spent, not belonging to the owner, no coins were spent twice. Okay, so going over the rules. If Bitcoin is digital gold, then using a full node is like checking you truly have real gold instead of fool's gold. You want to accept a cash bank note without checking it's genuine. The same applies for Bitcoin. Security. All these checks done by the full nodes uh, also increase security. There are many attacks possible against lightweight wallets, which are the SBV, SBVs, uh, that do not affect full node wallets. There's not just mindless paranoia. There have been real world example, examples where full node users were unaffected by trauma of the rest of the Bitcoin ecosystem. The July 4th, 2015 accidental chain fork affected many kinds of wallets. Uh, and here's a Wikipedia of the event. Um, we're not going to get into that. Notice how node software update months ago were completely unaffected by the fork. All other wallets required other extra confirmations or checking that a third-party institution was running the correct version. A Bitcoin business like an exchange marketplace or online store should always use a full node for security. And many of them do. Many of them run their own full nodes for themselves to, for that um, purpose. Privacy. Full node wallets are currently the most private way to use Bitcoin, with nobody else learning which Bitcoin address belongs to you. All other lightweight wallets leak information about which addresses are yours because they must query third-party servers. So you're not able to use um, blockchain spies if you have a full node, um, if you're running your own full node. 
Electum servers, which use um, addresses belonging to you and can link them together. Despite Bloom filtering, lightweight wallets based on Bitcoin J do not provide much privacy against nodes who connected directly to your wallet or wiretappers. For some cases, such privacy may, may not be required, but, but important reasons to run a full node and use it as a wallet is to get a full privacy benefits. Now, there are um, wallets out there that can connect to your full node. So, like, the Armory and Join Market um, use wallet software that is backed by a full node. Uh, you can use a light wallet that connects to your full node. That's what MultiBip does. You can run your own uh, full node at home. And Electrum can only connect to your Electrum server. So there are ways for you to do that. Um, I think MultiBit is mobile and so is Armory. But I think if more Bitcoin wallets would allow you to connect to your full node, I think it would allow for a greater security and greater ease of usage of you for those who are very privacy concerned or who are, or who are running their own businesses. And they may need to be mo mobile and they can't, you know, lug a full node or something like that to do all their transactions. Now, while in general, um, downloading the client, uh, the B Bitcoin QT or any uh, wallet system has a full node cap capabilities attached to it, has gotten easier. Again, still needs to be much, much easier than what it is right now. Um, syncing is... Uh, it takes a very long time to sync to get the whole blockchain. Two, it's it kind of the U, the UI mechanisms for for these type of wallets and syncing and, and uh, making sure your node is fully operational could be much 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 simpler. It needs to kind of be like a one two three four type of a deal. It needs to be like an app. You need to be able to download it, open it, um, enter your information, and you're done. That's it. And I don't think we've gotten to that point when it comes to the operations of a full node, if you will. So on to SPVs, and then we'll wrap things up with um, decentralization. So what is an SPV, and why does everyone keep talking about it, sometimes a little bit in a disparaging manner? So simplified payment verification is SPV. A definition, this comes from Bitcoin.org, is a Method for verifying if a particular transactions are included in a block without download, downloading the entire block. The method is used by some lightweight Bitcoin clients. Um, synonyms for SPV are SPV, uh, Supply Payment Verification, Lightweight Client, Thin Client. And here's another definition, um, Thin Client Security, which is from the Bitcoin Wicca. Recently, there have been a number of proposals for Bitcoin clients which do not store a complete copy of every block in the entire blockchain. This page will refer to all such clients as thin clients, and the page is meant to be a place to make, to make sense of the security and trust implications of these various um, schemes. So full node versus thin clients. It's important to distinguish between block height verification and block depth verification. A full node client verifies that all preceding blocks are valid in order to guarantee that a transaction is valid. Currently, only Satoshi's client, uh, LBP client, BCCD, do full node verification. Full nodes are fundamentally anchor of trustless security in the Bitcoin system. So this definition has been a bit old. Um, there's Armory, there's Electrum, there's a few wallets out there that do the same thing. A client verification, the depth V of a block by checking that there are D blocks after is called confirmation. All which are well formed. Thin clients don't verify the preceding blocks. They use a the number of confirmations. Confirmations, whether they are valid or not, as to measure the likelihood of a blockchain reorganization produce a new longer fork which exceeds transactions. So they don't check the entire blockchain. They check pretty much in like the most recent block and see, okay, is it following the rules? Is it If it's so, then good. Not even if it's valid or not, because it's like a really quick glance or a quick check of the system. So you can get fooled or... Hoodwink, and that's why some people are concerned about these light wallets, if you will. So, dropping down here, uh, thin clients. The client downloads a complete copy of the headers for all blocks in the entire blockchain. That means they download and store the requirements scale linearly with the amount of time since Bitcoin was invented. The scheme is described in Section 8 of the original Bitcoin white paper. So, thin clients were considered when um, Bitcoin was developed. As Satoshi writes, the thin client can't check the transactions for himself when linking into a place in the chain. 
You can see that the network node has accepted it and blocks added after it, further confirming the network has accepted it. If we take X to be the number of blocks added after it, then the thin client essentially trusts the transaction X block B will be costly to forge. This is very different from the trust model in the, in the thick client. The thick client verifies that the transaction inputs are unspent by actually checking the whole chain up to that point. There's no X block deep involved here. At that point, it uses X block steep to decide how likely it is that a longer, the longer fork in the chain will emerge, which excludes that transaction. So thin clients just, for example, say if you have a thin client and you're checking to see if a Bitcoin that's been sent to you um, is being double spent or whatever. So it's being sent to you on the 23rd. And so what you do is you look back to the origin date of that Bitcoin and say it's like January 19th. So you look at all from January 19th and to 23rd, all that transaction history up to that point, And you figure that, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, you know, four days worth of history is too much to fake for it to be invalid. So you, you're going to accept it. And that's what thin blocks do. They, they look and see and they and they make a, I guess you can say, a software judgment call that there's no way you could have faked all these type of transactions attached um, to that Bitcoin. So serving trusting clients. Uh, these clients involve a high-level trust in the server they rely on, uh, mechanisms for, op for authenticating the server, and confirming that the server has not been compromised is usually not explained. All thin clients listed below currently connect to a single server and are vulnerable to attack similar to double spinning. The attack can be run by a single server. The server can just lie to them, but then receive a Bitcoin transaction. And they assume the server does not lie, performing some servers, transferring funds or some goods, without actually receiving a, any Bitcoin exchange. Therefore, they are implicitly trusting it. Uh, further enhancements have been suggested that we'll have a client talk to multiple servers, podcasts, transactions, and query all of them. Unfortunately, it's well known to security researchers that it does not actually increase security. It simply makes the exploits more complicated and difficult to find. As security researchers have named this model, it is called a civil attack. This post on Bitcoin, doc, Bitcoin Talk explains how some governments, notably Iran and China, already perform these sorts of attacks on their own citizens with the, the coerced assistance of SSL uh, certif certification authorities. Uh, clients with a checkpoint even a very old one, that download and validate the headers of the whole blockchain are, are not vulnerable to syllable attacks in the following sense. They can always ensure that they can, that an attack would cost more than the amount being stolen. So that's the thing about what a lot of these mobile wallets and a lot of these thin wallets is they're, they're subject to attack, but the economic incentive to either forge or uh, fake an attack would be so costly that it, it can't occur. But doesn't mean that it won't occur. Someone might just pull the trigger because either they have the funds or they don't really care this is successful, only that the event itself has occurred. And so these are kind of the vulnerabilities that um, are with SPV wallets. And this is why some people are frowning upon them because they can either consider it an increase in centralization of Bitcoin because nobody's running full nodes to validate and transact all the time, but even with um, the few Bitcoin wallets out there that connect to a full node, it, the community in itself has not made it very easy for you to be mobile and have a full node. And the quicker that we're capable of doing it to make it so easy to do, the more people will run full nodes at home. They'll have like a, a computer somewhere or as we talked about when we talked about nodes, a Raspberry Pi hooked up to where they're able to um, do all their transactions mobily and still have um, the full node security. And then I have two additional articles. One is about the potential of having um, a mobile downloadable wallet and making it possible. And the other was just talking the difference between API wallets and SPV wallets. But API wallets are not really brought up much in the discussion of the Bitcoin block size debate just simply because all of them are kind of rolled up into SPVs and it's not really important to know the difference at this point in time. So up next is decentralization. So all this talk about SPV wallets, nodes, uh, ASIC chips, all this is a result in the, uh, you can say, the contentiousness of some people or at least the positions they're 
uh, they hold when it comes to these different Bitcoin proposals, um, including the ones we've talked about and the one um, that we haven't reached yet, which is SegWit. Uh, you know, the Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin XT, um, Bitcoin Unlimited, is that it's going to change the decentralization of Bitcoin because what's going to happen is uh, you raise the block size limit and there, there are going to be people out there that are not going to be able to, you know, operate the nodes. Uh, miners are going to have to adjust their investment. There might not be as many miners, which will not secure the network. Uh, more and more people are going to utilize SPV wallets because they can't operate a node. And some of it's silly, um, as we stated in each section, but some of it, it has some truth to it. But what is decentralization and what does it look like? So we're going to talk about the, that a little bit about the subject of decentralization and what does it mean for um, not only the block size debate but for cryptocurrencies in, in general. So we talked about decentralization in the past. Um, I'm just going to reiterate, I'm just going to go straight and wake up. And it's a process of redistributing or dispersing functions, powers, people, or things away from a central location or authority. So when it comes to Bitcoin, there is no central authority. There's no one governance, no one company, there's no one person in charge of Bitcoin. Um, everyone pretty much does, in fact, have a say. Uh, they can fork if they want to, and we'll talk about forking when we get there. Uh, they can participate at whatever level they would like. They can run a node if they want to. They can be a miner if they want to. They can be a trader. They can open and operate a business. They can just simply be a user. And it's dispersed in such a fashion because one, it's uh, the best decentralized systems are ones that are open source. You can see everything. And so everyone can look at the code, judge the code, determine what the code uh, it is. And it also goes for hardware where they can look at the hardware, look at the chips or whatever the hardware device is. Uh, break it down themselves, figure it all out, and then manufacture it themselves. With that component and the ability to transmit information on the internet, you can download, upload, uh, and participate in a decentralization, 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 decentralization system in a pretty, very reasonably easy manner. All you have to do is have an internet connection, and whatever level you wish to participate in, you can do so or eventually acquire the necessary means to do so. And this is a, one of the primary strengths of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin is that it's decentralized. No one controls the full power of mining. Anyone can download different mining clients and mine if they want to. You can run a node if you want to. You can use an SV wallet if you want to. All these different things you can do, and it's dispersed and spread out throughout the globe. Now, there is a bit of a caveat because it has to do with culture and penetration of the Bitcoin ecosystem is still heavily in the westernized world, very heavily in the first world. So you see a lot of uh, nodes in mining and, you know, places like China, nodes operating in India. And even in the western world, it's not as dispersed as it perhaps should be when it comes to nodes. And we uh, kind of talked about that when we talked about nodes themselves. But because of this dynamic and because anyone can participate, download, and engage in the network and add to the strength of the network, you can't attack it in any one group. If you were to, you basically would have to shut down the entire internet in and of itself in order to do that. Now, you may ever be able to cut, up, cut off aspects of the internet, like if you were able to shut off the internet, like in Turkey, or what country was it that did it to protect their um, exam level. Uh, testing when their students went and did exams. They pretty much shut down the internet in their country. Uh, I want to say it was Kenya, but I'm not positive. Uh, you can do things of that nature, but you won't end up killing the network itself because it's so widely distributed. The other key component is, as like I said, there's no central location, there's no central authority. And because there's no central authority, there's no one group or one individual that can control and say, this is how Bitcoin is, or this is what needs to be done, or this can go. Uh, you have to get consensus. You have to have everyone kind of go, going into agreement. And if they're not in agreement, you can either um, adjust your thinking or adjust your proposal, or people like fork or do their own thing and create their own type of system, saying this is the better way of doing things. That's why you have um, 
all these different cryptocurrencies out there because they saw and looked at Bitcoin, saw what it was doing and said, I can do this, but do it better. Or I can add these different types of systems and make uh, that coin um, more efficient or more uh, privacy driven or a coin that allows for smart contracts, things of that nature. So continuing on, while centralization, especially in the governmental sphere, is widely studied in practice, there's no common definition or understanding of decentralization. The meaning of decentralization may vary in part because of the different ways it's applied. The concept of decentralization is applied to group dynamics and management science and private business and organizations, political science, law and public administration, economics and technology. So we're just really focusing on technology. Because Bitcoin is decentralized, because it doesn't have a central authority, even when it comes to the code, uh, I know there's a Bitcoin core and they have developed and run the protocol and done all the upgrades uh, since pretty much the in inception of Bitcoin and a number of the individuals have been participants in. It does not mean that they are the keepers of the gate. This is why you have all these different proposals. This is why we're having two different segments going on. Uh, you know, anyone can contribute to the protocol, and as long as they get consensus, as long as they reach the Noku Nakamoto consensus, then that's going to be protocol, and that is going to be, you know, Bitcoin. So here we're going to read a, a few of the articles here about decentralization. One is by Eric Morris, who is responsible for Shapeshift. Uh, the new product they have out about uh, getting all those ICO tokens with Ethereum. I think it's called Prism. Yeah, it's called Prism, where you're able to have a very secure wallet or portfolio, if you will, to allow you to be able to trade or participate in these different uh, tokenizations of all these different companies. So here we go. It's from Bitcoin Magazine. It came out in 2015, almost two years ago. So, in Bitcoin truly decentralized? Yes, and here why is it important. Those within the industry understand that one of Bitcoin's most important features and perhaps its true core innovations is decentralized structure. Bitcoin has no central control, no central repository of information, no central management, and crucially, no central point of failure. Yet, most of the actual services and built businesses built within the Bitcoin ecosystem are centralized. So like your mining, um, your exchanges are centralized, and even some of these wallets, these SV wallets that we talked about are centralized. So these are points of vulnerabilities when it comes to Bitcoin as a whole. They are run by specific people in specific locations with specific computer systems and they are susceptible to specific legal entanglements, but especially exchanges. And because of that vulnerability, it's becoming increasingly difficult for people to obtain cryptocurrency beyond, I think, just either tipping, being given to it, or earning it. Um, but I digress here. So the situation creates tension and certainly a little irony. We have a decentralized technology, yet most of the things existing upon it are centralized. To a casual observer, even more to a cynical one, it may appear that the claim of deep Bitcoin's decentralization is a myth, an overstated feature conjured up as a bullet point in Bitcoin's marketing brochure, but specifically not apparent in the actual product. Consider the structure of Coinbase, which is arguably the most successful Bitcoin wallet and payment service in existence, there's nothing decentralized about it, and there's not, and it also operates uh, an exchange and everything. Consider the Coinbase internal policies that resemble PayPal's, not the distributed utopia Bitcoin coiners imagine. Coinbase wants to know who you are, they want to know what you're doing to money, and they'll block you if they disapprove. They spy on you and control you as much as any traditional financial system. And to be fair, it's not really their fault. Enforcers with guns will throw them in a cage if they don't do these things. It occurs under duress. So questions arise. How can Bitcoiners claim decentralization when the premier Bitcoin service has essentially become a bank itself? Critics point to centralized exchanges, wallets, and payment processors to condemn Bitcoin's claim of decentralization. When Mapbox exploded, losing half a billion dollars of customers' money, critics expressed immense skepticism that Bitcoin was really anything unique at all to them. It looked like just another new medium from which people are spied on at best and ripped off, scammed, and defrauded at worst. So is it Bitcoin's claim of decentralization a lie? No. <clears throat> and here to understand, and here's why. To understand Bitcoin, one must understand the difference between a corrosive centralization and a market-based centralization. Bitcoin processes the latter, but avoids the former, and that is a crucial distinction. 
Corrosive digitalization is what we all experience in the legacy financial industry. The world's monetary system is based upon a na national fiat currency created and managed by government sponsored central banks and it's corros in in uh, corrosive. It is corrosive because the entities with power over money's creation, regulate and transfer, have the will and power to hurt you if you disobey. Not only that, but you are coerced in the first place, being forced to pay taxes and settle debts using only your government's anointed currency. If you like to experience the corrosion uh, firsthand, try creating some dollars and you find yourself thrown in prison, your property taken from you, or try to transfer in dollars in any way that is unauthorized, and then you will see what uh, corrosion means. Uh, the entire financial system as it exists today rests upon the anti-market model of corrosion. Min money moves only with the permission of those in control, and th they're not in control by mutual contract but by privilege of the violence. The various po poisons such corrosion bespose upon society are top topic for another essay. But the only reason people suffer the system is because it's been the only game in town. So, basically, because you know you have things like if you deposit or transfer anything more than 10k, your bank reports it. Um, if they consider it, even not even if they consider it a, a suspicious money activity, that's just the minimum threshold. They can they can still put it up to the chain to the feds. Um, transferring your wealth out of the the states in or any country is very difficult. Wire transferring it takes days, weeks, or even months for you to send this money across. Try to take cash out that's more than ten thousand dollars. Um, on a plane or a boat or something like that, and you're going to have problems. The entire financial system as it exists today rests upon the anti-market. Okay, we already read that. So yes, coin, so multi, the market-based centralization is fundamentally different. It's a key feature in the ability to opt out. Yes, Coinbase is a centralized entity, but you don't need to use Coinbase to use Bitcoin. Yes, a Bitcoin exchange or web wallet is centralized, but you can always trade coins with a friend directly over the blockchain or store it in a local wallet without the permission of any third party. So that's very key. You don't have to participate in using the web wallets or coin base or anything like that. You can do things like have an open dime stick. You can um, you can have a paper wallet. You can just have um, you know brain wallet and keep the 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 twelve word phrase to open up the wallet in your head to be able to transfer the private key and the public key to somebody else or to yourself in a different manner. Uh, you don't have to participate that way. You can use only, you know, your desktop for all your transactions. Um, or if you're able to create a, like a sufficient mobile device that you can carry around, like, I don't know, a laptop or something more portable than that, that's capable of having a full node on it, which is, I think is a hundred gigabytes or more for Bitcoin, then, you know, something like that, you can be able to do your transactions. Or a hardware wallet. There's all these different types of methods of using um, Bitcoin. A user of fiat is always forced to utilize a centralized service. A user of Bitcoin is never forced to utilize a centralized service. This is a key distinction between centralization found in Bitcoin, which is market-based, and centralization found in traditional banking industries, which is corrosive. And this ability to ad adopt opt-out, which while it may seem modest, enables wonderful things to happen. But the discipline of marketplace can be realized. Consider since every Coinbase user can opt out and leave the platform, this presents a natural check on Bitcoin based ability to act with impropriety and make corrosion impossible. Compare this to the model of a bank, which is able to burden its customers to a far more significant degree because it knows that if its customers want to participate in a meaningful way in the financial system, they have to use a bank and associate fiat currency system. You can't, there are some places still in the country where you can operate just solely on cash, I think. Personally, really, it's like maybe like Las Vegas, maybe a little bit of New York. Um, maybe to some extent, New Orleans. Um, some places have like, you know, kind of maybe LA to a bit. Like you can purchase at home in cash or cars in cash. And it's not a big deal. No one bats an eye. But... Where are you keeping that cash? Are you keeping it at home under a mattress? Um, it can be a bit of trouble. And there's some places that won't take your cash. They will ask for a cashier's check from a bank. They want you to be associated with the bank and they want nothing to do with the cash, even if it's from legitimate means. So it's thus by clear that Bitcoin enables users to withdraw into the, nat the neutral pasture of decentralized financing at any time, which means that any centralized service within the sphere exists only at the pleasures of its customers. And this could radically change if any of these um, 
particularly any of these uh, decentralized exchanges were ever to successfully take off, like Big Square and there's a few others uh, that we talked about in the past, but Big Square being one of the biggest ones. If they were ever to successfully take off and able to get market penetration, and a local Bitcoin is still extremely successful, even with all the different attack vectors it's been uh, experiencing um, throughout its very existence. If this becomes extremely successful to where more and more people are able to, to obtain cryptocurrency with ease, and one of the big things I think really with these decentralized exchanges and local Bitcoin is the markup is just is too outrageous, really. Uh, if they were to lower really lower down a little bit to more of a a reasonable manner, I think those places would even take off even further and have a stronger market penetration. But that's just not really the case right now when it comes to these traders, not traders that, that trade um, in cryptocurrency. A banking system that you can't really get away from because unless you're paying in cash all the time, get paid in cash, pay your bills in cash transact in everything in cash and I, I've done that in the past personally when I was much younger and it was much easier to do and it's more acceptable to have cash because there was still a large enough population to where uh, using debit or credit cards uh, for every transaction was just not a thing that was done you know people were still write, you know writing checks and now there's very few places that even are willing to accept checks unless you're in an area where there's a high concentration of um, retirement people elderly people then you might see yes we accept checks and they'll you know you're waiting in line and you see this little old woman you know writing now the check for her groceries and you know the cashier takes it and runs it through the system and it's pretty much acting just much like a, a debit card if you will really just a paper debit card but it's, it's much more and more difficult to where it's not the case. And there's a lot of places now that don't accept cash. They don't. It's just debit or credit. But because of Dodd-Frank, I've also seen a lot of people places that don't have um, the debit and credit card machines because they don't want to deal with the, the payment uh, processors. So they just accept cash. And the marijuana industry, which has grown because of California, Washington, Colorado, uh having such an industry in Nevada beginning July 1st because uh, they can't participate in the banking system. Uh, they're cash only and this causes problems. So I believe in the state of Colorado, it became such a problem because they, the state in of itself was running out of 10s and 20s, which is mind boggling. I don't think the state of Nevada will have the same issue because of the casino industry, which is heavily cash based. Uh, which is why in Las Vegas you could literally purchase a home in cash or even a luxury car in cash and no one bats an eye. But I don't think they will have that same type of issue because there are so many banking infrastructures in there. I'm surprised they haven't put um, one of those Fed buildings, uh, the Federal Reserve building in Las Vegas. I mean, I know it's in Denver, Colorado, but I'm surprised they haven't, you know, <laughs> plopped one there and started printing things out because there's so much cash, both uh, USD and other foreign currencies slushing through that area. Um, but a lot of other places will, and it affects other regions. If all the cash is being plopped in um, one industry and they're not able to deposit or disperse it at a, 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 a pace that um, most other companies or industries are capable of doing this. It's almost a hoarding effect, if you, if you will. But anyways, that's another digression. But yeah, those are the type of consequences you can have if you can't utilize the banking system. Um, you have to build your own saves. Uh, you have to pay your employees in cash. You pay your bills in cash. Um, and holding cash to risk you know, being robbed all the time because you're a cash-based business. You're almost like a bank, in a sense. And thus, the forms of market-based centralization found with the Bitcoin land now needn't be feared or condemned as one with the corrosive centralization of legalized financial systems. What we, what we have indeed is something fundamentally different, which is wholly compatible with the free market structure and intent of Bitcoin's genesis. Indeed, a free market will eventually lead to some points of market-based centralization when economic efficiencies can be found. Every voluntary organization of people or resources is market-based centralization, and by definition, there's an inability to coerce those who partake. The key is to judge it, is judging the legitimacy of legitimization and always the ability of users to output, to opt out. Uh, big, 
Bitcoin pr proves this, while fiat and central banks do not. This is the difference is the one that the world will soon come to appreciate. So, so when talking about, as we talked about these nodes and the ASIC miners and the SB wallet, SB wallets and the centralized people seeing the centralization of Bitcoin because of these channels. They're saying they're what they're saying with these different protocol upgrades, and a lot of this comes from Bitcoin Core. But so many users are saying this when you uh, upgrade from one megabyte to two megabytes, or even up to eight megabyte mega uh, megabytes, is that you're going to cause um, these centralized uh, systems like these exchanges or miners, and they're going to have such a hardened stay that you might as you pretty much are what you're doing is recreating the banking infrastructure with the Bitcoin protocol. And that's not the point by keeping their position is by keeping the megabyte low, you're allowing for more people to operate and opt out. And if they can't opt out because they don't have the technical means, the technology to opt out, then you have created a centralized system. In some instances, that is the case um, for uh, the third world, really. They, they might not have the necessary means to um, operate a node. Um, we've talked about the, the one node operating um, in one country and things of that nature. But there is that issue. But at the same time, hardware has become more effective and more efficient to where there's still room for people to operate even in, in um, third world countries or even just now. Uh, one of the primary reasons that people are not operating nodes is they think it's difficult to do. They have to wait almost a week to download the Bitcoin chain. And they have to have a broad uh, broadband connection really to fully, completely participate. This is just a, a first world thing. And then people talk about just the cost of operating um, a node in itself. You know, the electricity cost, which I think is extremely nominal if you think about it, an extra 40 bucks a year to run a node. Uh, we already went through the process and I already discussed how it's, it's pretty nominal if you think about the value that you're getting out of uh, running a node um, your own way. Uh, all the different hobbies that people have and we discussed it earlier in the episode. But I think really what it is, is just it has nothing really to do with the hardware having a desktop, if you will, which you pretty much really need to use, or you can use a high-end laptop. It's downloading the entire thing in itself, which takes time. But the actual, I think, one, two, three punch of the software um, applications of downloading the entire Bitcoin blockchain and running the node in itself, I think um, it could be much, much easier. And I will do a Heroja Thought Bubble where I talk about about Bitcoin and some of these other nodes that are out there, these other node implications that people have put out there that are supposed to make things easier for people. And I will see for myself if it is much easier, if it runs much better, if people are able to really, if this is really a one, two, three punch. You have to think, most people operate online through their mobile device. They, they go to whatever app store, Google, um, you know, Apple, they pick, you know, Pokemon Go. So they go into the, they turn their, you know, their phone is on. They go to the app store. So that's one, they move to the app store, whatever app store they're on. They click on the app store. They type in Pokemon Go. Maybe Pokemon Go is trending. And so all they have to do is just the front page, click on Pokemon Go. So there's the second step. They chose Pokemon Go and they see, you know, all the different requirements and make sure that it is the right Pokemon Go. This is what they want, what they need to do, how much you know, um, space on their phone they need to have. Maybe they need to get rid of some stuff that they're not playing. Maybe they're playing, you know, uh, Gordon Dash or some other chef game or whatever. And they download that, uh, you know, they get rid of that so that they can play this game. So then I have to get out, go uninstall something and come back in. So that might be a third step for some people. But for most people, that might not be the case. And then they download. As soon as it downloads, it takes do 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 you know, I would say less than 90 seconds, maybe a little bit more than three minutes. Depends on your connection, data, Wi-Fi, whatever it is. But say the most is five minutes of your time. As soon as it's on your phone, it pops up. Do you want to open it? You click open. So that's really, you know, you down, you go to the app store. You choose, choose Pokemon Go. Three, you hit the download button. Four, you open it and you're ready to go. It is that simple. It's five simple steps, and I think that's what needs to be done for these node 
operate operations. It needs to be five simple steps to where it is downloaded. You know, you choose it. You know what the software parameter is. You know, you make sure it is what it is. You know what the software parameter is. You download it, and then you open it, and you can run it. It's, it has to be that dead simple if you want to get more node operators, really. And that will help strengthen um, the security of the network and the decentralization. So here we go with a few other articles, and then we'll just kind of wrap up this episode. So this is a little bit, and because we're discussing the Bitcoin block size debate, a little bit knock about the decentralization of Bitcoin, because that's to do with the governance. So Coindesk. Decentralization and governance. Can Bitcoin have the best of both? Um, August 13th, 2016, written by Ariel uh, de Chappelle. So, Ariel de Chappelle is a content manager of a blockchain real estate startup, Ubiquity, and a recent Henry Hazlitt fellow at the Foundation of Economic Education. In this opinion piece, de Chappelle argues that in order to solve issues around decentralized governance, the blockchain community must ask difficult questions about what kind of decentralized solutions needed. Since the earliest days of Bitcoin, the decentralization has been key to the value proposition, but also been its greatest obstacle. Whether it's the block size debate or the Ethereum Classic debacle, more broadly, decentralization is a public blockchain network presents significant hurdles to what can seem like a straightforward objective. After seven years of open source study, decentralized governance remains a little explored and unsolved enigma. By solving, okay, I just wanted to say I don't think the Ethereum Classic is a debacle, and as we be going more and more on the different issues in the block size debate. I think I'm going to have to cover it in our discussion uh, when we're talking about um, the, the potential fork that can happen. I, I don't. It's an open source decentralized community where anyone can pretty much do anything they want. If somebody wants to fork and is capable of making that fork chain work, then that's the way it goes. That's just my personal opinion, but. On the subject of just breaking it down, we'll, we'll break down um, the DAO again um, and what happened with that. By solving it likely means going back to the beginning and asking what exactly we mean by decentralization. Do we need do we mean the distribution of the hashing power, the number of nodes, the inherent ability to fork and succeed and recently demonstrated by Ethereum? So yeah, this is this is all part of the debate. Is it about hashing power? Do we need more mining pools out there that is not, you know, majority, 80% of it is being really in China. The number of nodes that are highly concentrated in America and, and broken down to various parts of Europe. Uh, the inherent ability to fork is to see as recently demonstrated by Ethereum, which is a strong possibility that could happen on August 1st. The exact definition of decentralization in cryptocurrency debates depends on the context. The semantics and technical terms need to obscure tend to obscure in the fact that at the heart of decentralization refers to a system of voluntary corporations between peers. Efficiency trade-offs. Decentralization is a means to an end. As a tool is not optimal for every possible use case, in fact, decentralization tends to be incredible and inefficient compared to centralized solutions. When it comes to transaction thought, for example, Bitcoin lags were behind centralization networks like MasterCard or Visa. Yet network distribution is necessary and prerequisite for serving the consensus role that gives Bitcoin its value such as immutability and progressive reward havings. Distribution in the network promotes extreme redundancies to safeguard against censorship and attack that were threatened these well-defined consensus roles. This comes at the inherent suspense of efficiency and transaction th- throughput, power consumption, and the overall pace of development. Yet the value of the digital network that can preserve these roles is so great that, the, that these costs are proven to be justified. As the foundation of the entire decentralized ecosystem, it becomes essential we understand are we able to maintain a network distribution before we start on the problem of governance? So that is very important. I think some people have discussed this, but I don't think this is very much discussed enough. And this is why I'm reading this article, because it just helps kind of give a framework, if you will, or at least, again, another perspective on how Bitcoin is viewed and this debate is being viewed, if you will, a lens, if you will. So a relative measure. Like hash power, network distribution is a pivotal factor when it comes to blockchain security. However, we have no definite metric for measuring hash power distribution. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean we're blind when it comes to determining preferences. Network distribution itself consists of identifiable contributing factors. These include the number of nodes that propagate transactions, the amount of mining machines, the number of operators behind both miners and nodes, and the geographic distribution of it all, and the number and size of mining pools. 
If we isolate any of these factors, it is trivial to determine what, what more or less distributed, distributed looks like. For example, 100 independent miners spread across the world are clearly more decentralized and less vulnerable than 100 clustered in the same region. But when we start to consider trade-offs, and then it begins to get murky. When we do this, the weight of these individual factors become largely determined by subjective preferences. Is it more decentralized to have 20 global space miners or 200 in close geographic proximity? And this is where you get the whole uh, Chinese um, mining uh, debate, which we covered very early on in our discussion of the block size debate. More decentralized. As we see, as we can see, when, we, when all is equal, identifying what is more decentralized is easy, easy despite the lack of a standard unit of measurement. It's when it comes to making potential development trade-offs on the profile level that it gets difficult. This is compounded because while decentralization is a means to the end, there's an important fact that we are missing. How much and what kind of decentralization do we actually need? What minimum amount of network distribution is required to ensure Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency continues to maintain security? The answer is nobody has an idea. The reason for this is no one predicted the scale and method of future attacks that would be carried out on a Bitcoin network. Given the right circumstances, a single black swan event in the form of a formal attack can have a tremendous negative impact. If Bitcoin is to become as successful as many hope, such attacks should not be out of question. Whether they are carried out by extremely well-positioned private parties uh, shorting the currency, <clears throat> which we um, recently saw with the flash crash of Ethereum, or an organized collection of state institutions determined to stamp out its popularity. So with the whole regulation where we make it extremely difficult to obtain cryptocurrency. Um, entertaining widely successful Bitcoin adoption demands, we take seriously the possibility of a coordinated attack on the network. For this reason, if any public blockchain hopes to become the core of a truly progressive and global financial web, they must be prepared for the worst. That means developers should be inclined to encourage network decentralization. So a delicate balance. But this alone is not an easy task. If we can if we could determine the minimum amount of distribution needed to ensure the worst possible attack would fail and ensure network changes do not push it below the threshold and victim, development decisions would be trivial. But we can't do either of those things. Bitcoin is a system of voluntary peers and th there lies the difficulty. We can't force stakeholders to run full nodes or prevent miners from doing pools that are certain or a certain size. And we know as great Greater decentralization in general is more secure, and the only way to encourage greater decentralization is a voluntary network is by incentivizing it. For no distribution, that means lowering the cost of running one or increasing the value of doing so. For mining, this includes improving block propagation to gate rate and advantage of larger pools. Such development would see the network become more distributed than it otherwise would be by making it easier, less costly, or more and and more advantageous to become a peer on the network. This is to say greater distribution may come at the end of the cost of everything else. There is a fact trade-offs are likely worth making for less decentralization. Bitcoin hash rate dwarfs the combined power of all the world's supercomputers. It rep represents the raw computing power securing each new block of transactions on the blockchain. It wouldn't be possible without specialized mining centers. Most trade-offs are not so clear, however. By allowing for larger blocks, the proposal will increase thoughtfoot, but like all economic action, this comes at a cost. Large blocks demand more computational resources from nodes and are more difficult to propagate amongst miners. However, because non-mining non full nodes lack monetary incentive, the benefit derived from doing so will remain the same after the limit increase. Because the cost of running the node rises with the size of a block and the benefits do not, then will all else be equal, there, there must be more nodes dropping off the network than there otherwise would be. I'm not sure that is really going to be the case. Because I think there's been too much of an overemphasis on the cost of running a node. Um, I know I talked a little bit about it when we talked about it. I might. Hmm. I'll think about it. But anyways, next challenge. The loan doesn't tell us if, you, if you, us if such a change is worth implementing. But because the cost of the network in terms of distribution is not zero, the burden of proof rests with showing there is a beneficiary and pressure needed to do so. In this particular case, that means showing that the block size limit is a limiting factor when it comes to Bitcoin adoption. If it's not, then there's no pressing need to increase thought put, and we can wait for solutions that do not risk impacting distribution at the base network layer. 
Given the importance of the network distribution and the inherent constraints in measuring and controlling, this should be the standard criteria for vetting decisions which can sway it one way or another. Ultimately, the more distributed the network is, the more secure and certain its future. If the prevailing ethos of modern law is innocent until proven guilty, then the guiding ethos of blockchain law should be decentralization and should prove otherwise. So long as the network distribution can be adequately maintained, it can serve as the basis for a larger and decentralized ecosystem of stakeholders and contributors who depend on securing a reliable blockchain. The next challenge is understanding the relationship and incentive of those de desperate stakeholders and determine how they can best work together to progressively improve the ecosystem without a centralized decision maker. Early objections against Bitcoin focused on the question of whether or not a deflationary digital currency with no sovereign backing would possibly become proper money. Yet the skepticism was misplaced. This is the most immediate or even the greatest challenge facing Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. The much more important question Punish should be asking is, can Bitcoin or a successor pull off decentralized governance? And as a new phenomenon, the decentralized ecosystem of cryptocurrencies presents novel problems for stakeholders and independent thinkers alike. These challenges are undoubtedly great, but so are the potential rewards. So there's that. I have two more articles in the decentralized um, uh, article here. One is about the forking of Dash to become um, to get back to uh, what people perceive Satoshi Nakamoto's consensus. And uh, or vision, if you will, and the head of Microsoft about decentralized identity and saying that Bitcoin's under attack. Um, I'm just going to read a little bit. I'm not going to read the full article from Coin Telegraph about Dash's plans um, for a fork. But again, this is you know it goes into the debate about what people view Bitcoin to be. So this is by Ike R. Uh, Bitcoin truly decentralized fork of Dash plans to lead the community back to Satoshi. The divide within the Bitcoin community is becoming wider and the necessity for Bitcoin scaling becomes more pronounced. A fork of Dash, a private instant verified transaction, PIVX, claims to have embarked on a process to change what it describes as a centralized nature of the voting process within the industry. Currently running a master node system which is inherited from Dash, Eric Stance's team member that as PIVX infers that Satoshi's original intent was that millions of individuals would be mining away on their GPUs Therefore, power within the community should be truly decentralized. Rather, what is obtained today is power being centralized to a few massive mining farms. So it's about, um, with them, about mining. So there's that in the article. So the whole, like, the whole point of this entire episode is just to kind of break down these components about nodes, hardware, um, the problems of running nodes, um, ASICs, the mining rigs, what an SPV wallet or node is and decentralization and why it's important so that when you know you're properly informed so that when people are talking about this you know the goods and bads and negatives of the di different proposals whether it be you know uh, bitcoin unlimited segwit segwit 2x or doing nothing uh, you have a kind of um, an understanding of somewhat of what it is that people are discussing and why it's essentially so important so that is it for this episode. Uh, thank you very much for listening and to the moon. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time.